and welcome back to Cafe Olay. My name is Jay. Here at Cafe Olay with Nefesh Benefesh, we go over the everyday Hebrew you need um, to survive here in Israel, whether that is reading and paying your bills, going grocery shopping, um, and reading nutritional labels, keeping up with the news, striking up a conversation, flirting, dating, complaining, job interviewing, all the everyday things you do in your native language, in your country of origin, but here in Israel, modern Hebrew. As always, we want to hear from you what topics you'd like us to cover. You can always email us at hebrew at nbn.org.il. That's H-E-B-R-E-W at nbn.org.il. Um, if you're joining us live on Zoom, you can write to us in the chat box with any questions, comments, concerns, requests you may have. We read we read the chat transcript after class. If you have any questions about the class we're about to start, that's what the Q&A is for. We're only looking at the Q&A tonight, but feel free to write to us in the chat. I just ask that you keep the chat to a um, not to personal things. And if you want to write to each other, by all means do so, but please keep that respectful in the larger chat in the window. Um, you can also see all of our previous lessons on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com. Type in Café Olé, you'll see a playlist, or it'll say view full playlist. We have over 100 videos, over 17,000 views, a lot of material there that is absolutely free for you to use. This class will be uh, uploaded ASAP, so you can continue to um, memorate Yom Ma'ut, which is about to begin here in Israel, Israel's Independence Day, which is part of what we're going to talk about today but also all of our previous lessons will be up there. You are also welcome to join us for our new Wednesday classes, Cafe Olay Conversations, where we take our Monday class and we turn it into a conversation-based class where you're broken up into um, small groups based on your proficiency level. And you are given some um, conversation prompts and between the vocab that we go through on Mondays and your own vocabulary, this is a chance to practice um, with like-leveled um, uh, Hebrew learners, which is a great opportunity um, to keep your practice going throughout the week. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, we First off, thank you for joining us at an earlier hour. We want to be sure that those who are joining us in Israel would be able to go to a um, um, any sort of event tonight. Um, we're going to go through in today's class, not just what has gone on um, almost 24 hours here in Israel with Yom HaZikaron, Israel's Memorial Day, but that immediately goes into Yom HaTzmot, Israel's Independence Day. Um, and in years past, we've done this and talked about all the various uh, fun activities that take place on Yom HaTzmot. Um, understandably, most of those are not happening this year, both on a governmental level, but also on a communal and personal level. A lot of the traditional things we do from the Air Force flyover show to the um, to barbecues outside people's homes have understandably either been canceled or curtailed. Um, this is a very difficult year for all of us. It's a very difficult day for us. Um, and knowing that how hard it is for families who've lost a loved one um, in the past year, how hard it is. Um, to mourn on Memorial Day and then to get up from a day of mourning into Independence Day, um, we're now feeling that on a collective level. So we're all going through all sorts of things at once on a larger level for the first time in a long time, perhaps at all. Um, so today I thought we would take you through not just what to expect during these two days, but also a larger conversation about us, Olim, Aliyah, Zionism, Israel, um, and some of the terminology you need to discuss it that you probably don't know or don't have yet in modern Hebrew. And I also want to just show you what's going on right now. And I also want to show a great clip um, that came out today with regards to Yom Azikaron and Olim, like us. Um, so first, those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I want to show you what's playing on TV right now. One of the very traditional things we see during Yom Azikaron is the naming of everyone who has fallen in battle. And it's not just in battle, but also in terror attacks since before the founding of the State of Israel. It actually begins with the first settlement outside the walls of the old um, city of Jerusalem. So in the 1860s, it already begins counting. It had already started before Yom, Yom HaZikaron began last night here in Israel, and it's continuing. I'll just show you where we are right now um, in it. 
and there's um, what we call Shirei Eretz Yisrael playing in the background. Um, songs of the land of Israel, which are more somber classic songs that are always told at this time. Play it a little bit in the back. And if you've never seen this before, what you're seeing at the top is if they were a soldier, it'll have the emblem of the state of Israel. It'll have their ranking, their name, um, a picture if it's available. And at the bottom, it'll have um, the day they uh, were killed or murdered, um, both the Hebrew date and the civilian date. And again, this scrolls all day will continue until we get to the end. Remembering that since last Memorial Day, we've added more than 1500 new names. Um, is still hard to, to process. Um, and the music stays in the background the whole time on the loop. About 20, 24 different songs. Okay. Um, oh, let me turn that off. So let's have a look at our vocab before we look at some other things um, to commemorate these two days. So as always, our vocabulary sheet, you are welcome to screenshot. You will get a copy of this um, uh, um, of this vocabulary along with a recording, a link to the recording of this lesson. So don't worry if you miss out on anything. Um, so, um, but you're also, you know, old school pen and paper or just follow along and watch the recording later, however you'd like. Um, so. The name of today, which we're still in for another just under two hours here in Israel, is not just Yom HaZikaron. And we talked about this last week with the word Zikaron. Zikaron in Hebrew means memory, but we use it um, as part of a longer name. And we simply just say Yom HaZikaron, and it's understood that we're talking about today. But this is the official name of it in Hebrew. Yom HaZikaron l'chalalei ma'ochot Yisrael u Yom Hazikaron, a day of memory, or a memorial day as we would translate in English. Yisrael. A halal is a very interesting word. Halal can mean both a space, it can mean space, capital S, like outer space. It can mean a space like inside an enclosed space, but a halal is also a fallen soldier. Okay, and so Chalalei Malchot Yisrael is a three-word compound noun. Okay, Chalalei is short for Chalalim. A Chalalim Shel Malchot Shel Yisrael. Malchot is campaigns, military campaigns or military battles. Okay, Malacha is one military campaign or military battle, and Malchot are plural. We use this word ma'ochot because it's not just milchamot Israel. It's not just the wars of Israel because soldiers have fallen in attacks that are not just um, declared wars. They've also been military operations. They've also been, you know, individual attacks. So that's why we use the word ma'ochot, a battle or a campaign rather than a war. Milchama, Israel, obviously, ulenif ge'e. Nifga, someone who is um, nifga is wounded. Okay, nifga means wounded or hurt, but we're using it here um, to say um, those who have fallen victims of pulotaeva. Pulotaeva is the proper Hebrew for the word we normally use in modern Hebrew, which is terror or terror or terror, terrorism. Okay, pulot are activities, eva of terror. So those who have fallen victim to acts of terror, a.k.a. terrorism. But again, because this is a important day, a sacred day, a holy day, they wanted to use in naming it, the state wanted to give it Hebrew words. Even though we use terror all the time, um, Pulotaiva is the proper way we say terrorism in Hebrew. One of the ways we say it. Okay. One of the words you hear a lot, not just today, but frankly, for the last 220 days, is the word shchol. Shchol is bereavement. It's also grief. Now you should put that in here. Shchol is grief as well as it is bereavement. 
um, a very important word in um, the, these last many days. And a mishpacha shekula is a bereaved family or a grieving family, right? We talk about that a lot during these days. Um, and when you hear the formal speeches given on Yom HaZikaron, they're usually first addressed to mishpachot shekulot, bereaved families, those who have lost a soldier or um, a family member to terror, okay? Um, just to go over the word chayal, because again, it's Yom HaZikaron, it's both a military, but it's also civilian. Um, chayal is a, fem- is a male soldier, chayalet is a female soldier, and because we are, many of us here in this class are olim, or this class is for olim, want to be sure to include a chayal boded and a chayalet bodedet, a lone soldier. A lone soldier in Israel is defined as someone who doesn't have immediate family to take care of them on a regular basis, meaning whether they have a weekend off or financial assistance or emotional assistance, they don't have a family structure to support them in addition to what the army provides because every soldier is given time off to go home, to get their laundry done, to have a place to live and to eat in between shifts or in between whatever it may be. Um, We talked about this last week in our conversation class. Um, Many lone soldiers in Israel are in fact not olim. Okay, there are olim who are also not lone soldiers. If they made aliyah with their family, they are not considered a lone soldier. Um, To be a lone soldier as an As olim means you made aliyah without your family, and your family lives abroad. By the way, if you didn't know this, a um, chayalim bodedim, lone soldiers whose family live abroad, are entitled to X number of um, weeks a year with a paid ticket to go visit their family, which is a great um, resource for them. But many chayalim bodedim in Israel are from families who can't support them socioeconomically or ideologically. So if a family has real hard time supporting itself, let alone um, its child who's gone off into the army, um, the they get certain benefits like a lone soldier does who doesn't have any family here at all. And this also goes for families that um, ideologically are against their service, particularly ultra-Orthodox, Haredim, um, soldiers whose family don't support their decision. And they receive also extra resources from the military and from the government. Korban or korbanot are victim or victims. This is a, even though it ends with ot, and we've talked about this before, when words end with nun, um, and they usually are pluralized with ot, um, that has nothing to do with their gender. In this case, victim or victims is still a uh, masculine word. Korban, korbanot. Victim or victims, this is the word that we use um, to describe someone who's fallen in battle, more particularly someone who um, was a victim of terrorism. Okay. Uh, last night and this morning, for those of us in Israel, you heard the Tzfirat Zikaron or the Tzfirat Dumia, two different terms for the same thing. Tzfira is a siren. That's certainly not lost on any of us in these last uh, seven plus months. Zikaron, again, memorial or memory. Dumia is silence. Okay, because we stand at at attention, we also stand in silence. Um, When it goes off, one minute last night, two minutes this morning. Tekes ceremony, many people either watched or went to a tekes last night as they might go tonight. Tekes simply means a ceremony. It could be any kind of ceremony. Um, We can even call a actual, um, for example, a bar or bat mitzvah can be called a tekes bar or bat mitzvah, referring to the actual um, service that takes place during it, right? In order to make them one. Um, What we just heard in reading and seeing the name scrolling of victims is, like I said before, Shirei Eretz Yisrael. Right, is the land of Israel songs. Um, and as I wrote here, nostalgic patriotic songs with a more somber tone that are played on days of mourning. There's a joke in Israel that um, um, people make when, God forbid, there's a terror attack or something really bad happens in the news because the music on the, t- on the radio 
instantly changes to this category of music and people say, oh, I love this music so much. And it's true, it's beautiful music. It's very poetic music. It's very patriotic music in terms of the lyrics. Um, we've gone through some of them before in the past. Um, and certainly on the radio right now, that's what you'll be hearing. Um, certainly that's what we heard for the first few weeks and months after the start of um, the war. Uh, um, because it has that nostalgic feel to the songs. Um, there are still songs like this being written and, and more than likely many more will be written in the um, coming weeks and months because of October 7th. Um, and along with music, and we talked about music and its importance in Israeli society and memory last week, this is no less important. Um, Sharim Bakikau, it took place last week, uh, last night rather, um, albeit in Palka Yolkon. This was a traditional event that took place every Yom Azikaron here in Tel Aviv in Kikar Rabin, where um, the stories of fallen soldiers and victims of terror were, were told, and then famous musicians would sing one of these Shirei Eretz Yisrael um, during it. It was a very popular um, event. It was um, broadcast on TV. At some point, it will come back, um, both because Kikar Rabin um, is under construction. Anyone who's been to Tel Aviv knows that it has been under construction for a while because of the Rakevet Kala, the light rail that is going to be um, traveling underneath it. Um, so the space simply is not available. Um, but that has to do with a larger uh, phenomenon that we talked about last week called Shira Betzibur, right? Shira Betzibur, singing communal sing-alongs are a very important part of Israeli society. Um, doing something emotional and societal together as a group, uh, very important. Um, it lends itself to all sorts of different iterations. There are some great YouTube clips you can see of from the 70s and 80s and even early 90s on different kibbutzim doing these sing-alongs during major holidays. Um, all the major reality shows in Israel that predate the ones abroad, many of them were communal sing-alongs essentially carrying on this tradition. Um, and that's a very important part, both in times of sadness and in joy. It's the reason why so much of it um, takes place during Yom HaZikaron. A cemetery is in Hebrew, um, which is where a lot of people spent today, or at least visited for a part, both of the official ceremonies, but also to visit the graves of loved ones, or perhaps people they never knew, but went to go give and pay respect. Beit Kvarot is the Hebrew term for it, a house of graves, Beit, Bait. Kever is a grave, Kvarot are graves. And Beit Almin is um, actually Aramaic, it is not Hebrew. Beit Almin gets best translated as house of eternity. Okay, those are two different terms that we use um, uh, in modern Hebrew in the state of Israel to um, designate a cemetery. Um, so if you're looking for it, for example, on a bus route or signage, these are the two terms you're going to find. You probably saw also in Israel or in years past, people wearing a um, sticker right above their chest. And it said in Hebrew at the top, Yizkol. We'll get to that word in a second in black. And then it had a picture of a flower, a green stem with a red um, dry, with a small red flower. That flower in Hebrew is called Dam HaMakabim literally means the blood of the Maccabees. Dam is blood, Maccabim, the Maccabees. And as it says here, it's a flower that according to tradition grows on every spot of shed. Get that there, shed blood from the Maccabees. It's very similar to the poppy that's worn in the UK and other Commonwealth countries during Memorial Day for them. Um, Dama Maccabim is um, a very traditional thing to see. The sticker, the actual flower is a protected species in Israel, but there is a um, NGO for the last few years that has gotten approval to grow these flowers um, in designated greenhouses so that ahead of Memorial Day, ahead of Yom Azikaron, they dry them and then sell them as dried flowers in these um, sort of in these pins. So instead of a sticker, it's a pin. It's a really beautiful uh, tradition that continued this year as well. Um, what's about to happen and the reason why we decided to teach earlier tonight is that many people normally go to a tekes ma'avar, 
Tekes we just talked about means ceremony. Ma'avar means passage or, or a transition. Okay. Um, in every normal, um, anytime you talk about, for example, a ma'avar ben levain, right? A passageway between two different places. Or ma'avar, a transition between two things. Tekes ma'avar can also mean a rite of passage in everyday speech. But when we talk about it specifically with Yom HaZikaron and Yom Atzmo, we talk about that precise moment that Yom HaZikaron ends and Yom HaZikaron begins. The whole idea is based on not just Jewish tradition of um, that we counterway all happy things with sad things, knowing that we aren't fully redeemed. Um, that goes to um, breaking a glass during a wedding, um, all sorts of other things throughout the Jewish ritual cycle that we do, um, but also understanding that when um, the State of Israel was founded in 1948, in fact, on May 14th, 1948, and Yom Atzmut this year does indeed fall on its original Gregorian um, date. Tomorrow will be the 14th of May. Um, the idea was we can't celebrate our freedom without acknowledging how we got it and the lives lost in order to defend ourselves. So when Yom Atzmot was codified, it was codified with Yom Azikaron falling immediately before it. There are still to this day um, arguments whether that's appropriate, that people don't have enough time um, grieving and all the grief that has been brought up after a year or perhaps less um, during Yom Azikaron to immediately go into Yom Atzmot. In any normal year, it's a very festive, happy, joyous holiday. Um, this year, we all feel that tension um, in a way that we many of us have never had before. The central one that takes place every year is in Har Herzl um, in Jerusalem, Har Herzl, and it's called Tekes Hadlakata Mesuot. Tekes again, ceremony. Hadlakata Mesuot. Hadlik is to light a candle. Hadlakat is the verbal noun, the act of lighting. Masuot. Masuot is one of the words we have in Hebrew for a torch. And the centerpiece of this ceremony, and it's shown live on TV, um, it starts at 7.45, is um, that uh, there are 12 torches representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Each one is lit by someone who has been um, nominated by the state of Israel, who's done something um, um, really extraordinary, either in the last year or in their life, according to the theme of that of that year's ceremony. This year, it's all in the shadow of October 7th. This year, there are many, many, many people lighting each, can each torch. Um, there's also a lot of people very upset of how it's being handled this year, um, that it should even happen at all, because there, frankly, as much as we are thankful to still be alive, there isn't much to celebrate this year for all sorts of reasons. Um, that being said, it is on at 745, but many communities, small and large, are having their own Tekes Ma'aval. Here in Tel Aviv, there are three different ones that the municipality is putting on. I know in Jerusalem, several um, neighborhoods are having their own. These can be as simple as reading um, some prayers and poems, um, and then going in, if it's a more religious one, going into a um, uh, prayer service into Tfilot. Um, for some, it's simply reading and making some comments and statements and maybe some speeches. Um, but the idea is this ceremony is important to make that transition. Think of it like Havdalah. For those of you who come from a Jewish background, that ceremony we do at the end of Shabbat to mark the end of it and going into the rest of the week. That's the feeling that this um, ceremony has. And it's a very, in a happier year, it's a very unique, it's a very important Israeli tradition. Um, that's worth watching. Uh, I'm just going to go through a little bit of what to expect in it. Yizkor is the name of the traditional memorial prayer. Not just that we said last week on Yom, on Yom HaShoah, but this week as well on Yom HaZikaron. Um, it begins Yizkor because it's Yizkor Am Yisrael. May the nation of Israel remember all of its fallen. Um, and that's the beginning of this Tekes Ma'aval. During the Tekes Adlakata Mesuot, each of the 12 um, torchbearers comes out with the background music being Anu Nosim Lapidim. We've covered the song before because it actually comes from the 1930s for Hanukkah. 
This was a Zionist song that was penned for um, Hanukkah. It's a very Zionist song in that it is all about the people bringing in the miracle. Um, that the miracle wasn't ordained by heaven. It was us building the land and um, bleeding and sweating to make, to bring about our redemption. Um, and it's a very um, military style march song. It's a really upbeat song and very patriotic song when you listen to it, but originally for Hanukkah that we now use almost entirely for Yom Atzmaut. And then at the end, each torchbearer, if you watch the central one, you'll see each torchbearer will give, um, will say their name and that they light this um, torch um, on behalf of, and they talk about their achievement and what they've done. And then they end, they sign off before they light it and saying, Ultiferet Medinat Israel, and for the splendor or for the glory of the state of Israel. Um, the Tiferet Medinat Israel, we've talked about this before, is one of my personal favorites as a toast. Um, L'chaim is wonderful, but it gets kind of redundant after a while. The Tiferet Medinat Israel is a great um, toast, should you um, find the opportunity to toast one another. Now I want to switch to something different, because normally in a normal year, we would talk about all the different fun activities we'd hear during um we do or see during Yom Atzmaut. And like I said before, many of those are canceled or people simply don't have the bandwidth or the emotional capacity to do any of it this year and quite understandably. So instead I want to zoom out and talk about Yom Azikaron and Yom Atzmaut in the context of us as Olim, as people who are maybe planning or already have done Aliyah. To talk about some words that we use when we talk about Aliyah, when we talk about Zionism that maybe you're not familiar with, but also that are great prompts to start conversations. This is also um, the text we're gonna use for those of us who are joining us on Wednesdays for our um, conversation class. These are gonna be some of the questions you're gonna ask each other to start um, your dialogue. But these are also good questions, not just to recognize, but also to be able to answer, which is what we're gonna do. First off, a great one. Matai alita o alit, la aretz o altsa. When someone asks you or you want to ask someone, when did you move to Israel? Or as we say in English often, when did you make Aliyah? You'll see here, I, have, I gave you a couple different options how to ask this question for a very important reason. First off, Matai Alita or Matai Alit, depending on gender. Um, the verb La Alot means to ascend and to make Aliyah. And that's a very important distinction that um, I always make. In English, we can't obviously use this verb, right? We don't have the same verb. In Hebrew, we do. Aliyah, the act of making aliyah, comes from the verb la alot. So all you have to do to ask someone, when did you make aliyah, is simply ask them to a male, matai alita, or to a female, matai alit. It is understood immediately the context. You are asking about aliyah. You're not asking about aliyah la Torah, you're not asking someone who has an aliyah to the Torah unless you are in a synagogue in that context. If you ask someone on the street or in an office or over a drink or whatever it may be, the context is always going to be aliyah when you use the verb la alot. If you want to specify it, you can say matai alita artsa. Artsa is the direction of haaretz. Haaretz, eretz in Hebrew means land. Haaretz, literally the land, right, means Israel. It always means Israel. When you say Haaretz, it always referring to the land of Israel. Or you can say Laaretz. When did you um, make Aliyah to Israel? Although it's redundant because you don't make Aliyah to anywhere else but Israel. Now, I am still, will not say this in the Hebrew translation of the English, but enough people say it and enough native Hebrew speakers have said it's okay to say this, that I include it. That's the only reason why when you translate the English version of asking this question into Hebrew, matai asita aliyah to a male or matai asit aliyah to a female. Technically, technically this is incorrect Hebrew folks. That's why I give it as an option because it is still vernacularly in the vernacular, in the everyday conversation, it is acceptable. But the proper Hebrew is matai alita alza, 
מתי עלית לארץ, או simply מתי עלית. You can use any of these options. Okay, but all of these questions ask, when did you make Aliyah? To answer this, you're going to say, you don't have to repeat Aliti, you can if you want, Lifne blank yamim shavuot chodashim shanim. The blank is where you're going to put in the number. I can't put in all the numbers because I don't know. We have 205 people on this call, which is absolutely amazing. You all have different answers for this. But when you want to say such and such time ago, this is how you're going to construct it. Lifne literally means before. Blank is insert the number. And then yamim, days, shavuot, weeks, chodashim, months, shanim, years. You decide, you pick the one that's relevant for you. But to answer that question, you're simply going to say one of those. So if I were answering it, I would say, Aliti lifne shmunai shana. I made Aliyah 18 years ago. Okay. Another way you could answer this question is, Ani metachnen or Ani metachnenet, depending on your gender. Ani metachnen or Ani metachnenet. Let's put in the Ani just so that you all understand that's the... Context here, אני מתכנן, אני מתכננת בעוד blank, and then the, the periods, ימים, שבועות, חודשים, שנים. לתכנן means to plan. It comes from the same root as תוכנית. Okay, so the verb to plan is לתכנן. אני מתכנן male, אני מתכננת female. I plan to בעוד in another blank, Yamim, Shavuot, Chodashim, Shanim. Okay, so for those of you who are planning to make Aliyah, you'll use this construct. And then for some of you on this call, absolutely all right. Od, either Lo Aliti or Od Lo Aliti. I haven't made Aliyah or I have not yet made Aliyah. Od here means yet. So if you say Od Lo Aliti, I have not yet made Aliyah, it means that, you know, it's, you're thinking about it in some way, whether it's realistic or not. Lo aliti, I haven't made aliyah. It doesn't rule it out, but you're being much more firm about your answer. Okay, let's look at another question, no less important, probably more important. Lama alita, or lama alit, or lama asita aliyah, lama asita aliyah. Why did you make aliyah? You've probably, all of you have made aliyah, you've probably gotten this question a million times, and they've been asked in all these different ways. You're going to answer it in your own way, obviously, but these are two ways to start your answer. Key, blank, or biglal, blank. If you answer, and we've talked about these words that all mean because or due to, or any iteration of those, key is always followed by what is essentially a complete sentence. Lama lita alza, aliti key. Uh, I made Aliyah because, key, I wanted to build a life in Israel. Okay? Versus if you answer Biglal. Biglal is always followed by a clause. It is not a complete sentence after the Biglal. Okay? Biglal, um, Lama Alita, Aliti Biglal Tzionut. I made Aliyah because of Zionism. Simple, quick answer with one or two words, okay? That's how you would answer using the word biglal. Both of these mean because, but they are followed by two different constructs. One, a sentence with key, and one, a clause with biglal. Another question you might get, but is also good to be able to answer, hayakashe le, and then followed by one of these verbs. Hayakashe le istagel, hayakashe le itaklem, all of these verbs more or less mean the same thing. Was it hard becoming an Israeli? Was it hard moving to Israel and everyday life in Israel, right? All these verbs are slightly different um, definitions from one another. Lehistagel means to become adjusted. Lehitaklem comes from the word aklim, so to acclimatize, to become acclimated. Lehit azreach comes from the word ezrach, um, citizen. So to become naturalized or to become a citizen. And lehit ragel, to get used to. These are all great verbs. So if you're asking someone this, 
היה קשה להסתגל? Was it hard to get adjusted? You could ask, you could answer it, לא, לא היה קשה להסתגל. It was not hard for me to become adjusted. He, or בגלל, right? I'm trusting you all to not just look at all these words together, but to actually incorporate them and get the connection between them so you can create your own sentences. Instead of me writing out sample sentences for all of them, I think you're all um, smart enough. I know you're all smart enough to put these all together. So I'm not going to add necessarily the reply sentence. You can figure this out also based on what we've already done. Now, here are some other words that we use um, on a regular basis to talk about um, where we are and what are we doing here. It's, um, we're not just here because. Um, that's always an important aspect of my Zionism, of everyone's Zionism. We're not just here because. So some important words. First off, the word Zionism, Sionut. Most of the time when you see a word ending with the, word, with the um, sound ut like this, it means it's a concept or an abstract principle. Not always, but most of the time it means something like that a way of life, a way of thinking. In this case, Tzionot, Zionism. Another word that we use to describe the state, the land, the, the society of people post-1948 is Tkuma. Tkuma comes from the verb Lakum, to get up. So Tkuma means a revival. Okay, um, This is the term that's used for the government's plans to revive the South after October 7th. Um, it's called Minhelet Tkuma, the revival administration, the Tkuma administration. We've talked about this word before. This is a really important word in Israeli society, even if you don't hear it. It's behind the scenes. It's thought of a lot. Even if you've never heard this word before, you've experienced it good or either you've experienced it or you've experienced the lack of it, probably more importantly. Mamlachti is the adjective, and mamlachtiut is the um, noun. Mamlachti and mamlachtiut have to do, originally, if, it, if you hear the word, mamlacha. Mamlacha is a kingdom, and melech is a king, right? But when we talk about it in the context of the state of Israel, mamlachti and mamlachtiut is a statesman or a stateswoman, mamlachtit, or statesman-like, and statesmanship. When we talk about statesmanship, we talk about nonpartisanship. We talk about um, working for everyone's interest, working to bring everyone together and all different um, opinions together, not to force them into submission or to make everyone agree the same way, but the understanding that everyone's going to have different opinions, but we're all in this together. Mamlachti is a very important concept that was really pushed by... Um, David Ben-Gurion, in terms of his approach to people who disagree with him, although he was not always mamlachti in his actions or words. Um, and we have, thankfully, we have some leaders who have over the years um, demonstrated mamlachtiut, the idea of working together of, above um, the political and ideological fray. The notion that the Nasi Medina the president of the state of Israel, or Nesiata Medina, should there be a female president of the state of Israel, should always display mamlachtiut. If you listen to how the current and previous presidents spoke, they speak in mamlachtiut, statesmanship, nonpartisanship, togetherness. Um, this is also a related but different um, connotation with regards to Harav Kuk. If anyone asks me about that, I'm not getting into that, but you can look that up on um, Wikipedia. Um, it also has to do with statesmanship, albeit from a religious perspective. Okay, another term that you're going to hear a lot when we talk about Zionism and Yom Atzmaut and Yom Azikron is Kibbutz Galuyot. Kibbutz Galuyot is not just the name of a street, or road, um, and it's not the name of a kibbutz, although it's a great name for a kibbutz. Um, kibbutz Galuyot. Kibbutz is not just a communal farm. Um, kibbutz literally me is the verbal noun of the verb lekabetz. Lekabetz is to gather. Okay, so kibbutz is the act of gathering together, or as I wrote here, in gathering. Galut is exile. Galuyot are exiled communities. 
right? There, we're not talking exiles in terms of um, uh, multiple exiles at the same time. We're talking about exiled people, exiled communities. When you hear the term kibbutz galuyot, the idea was that, um, and still is, that the state of Israel is um, meant to be kibbutz galuyot. One of its actions is meant to be kibbutz galuyot, to bring in um, the exiles, i.e. Jews who live in diaspora. Whether that happens or not, this is still a stated um, aim of the state of Israel, an important part of its thinking in terms of all the different things with regards to Aliyah. We have two different terms for independence. We actually have a third one um, that has to do with sovereignty, but these are the two that are really important this time of year. Atzma'ut. Atzma'ut comes from etzim, self, and atzma'i, independent. Atzmi is myself. Atzma'ut, however, is independence, the idea of being independent, separate from yourself, by yourself, oneself. Okay? We also have another term in Jewish tradition that's older than Atzma'ut, which is kumemiut. Kumemiut comes from the same root as that, ver as that word kuma, from lakum, to get up, right? So the idea of getting up and reviving something, meaning um, sovereignty. Okay? So all these words are just some of the, the buzzwords, terminology you hear, especially this time of year, but especially since October 7th, they've had sort of extra meaning and extra usage. Um, when we talk about these questions, why did you move to, Ali, to Israel? Was it hard to make Aliyah and things so, as such? It's also important to think about ourselves. What are the different Hagdarot and Nitiyot that we use? A Hagdara is a definition or a category. And Nitya is an orientation, not an orientation like something you go to, but orientation is in how you are oriented personally, ideologically, and so forth. These are important when we talk about our identity as a Yisraeli or Yisraelit, an Israeli. Not all of us, um, those of us who've made Aliyah, and this is very important, and I always, always say this, whether you made Aliyah or were born in Israel, Kulanu Israelim. We are all Israelis. Um, I, among many things, not just teaching here, I've started a couple of social initiatives. One was a series of salon gatherings for Olim to talk about the issues that affect us in a safe um, space. And it's fascinating to see how many Olim do not call themselves Israeli will not call themselves Israeli. They'll call themselves Olim. They'll call themselves American. They'll call themselves Westerners, anything, but they won't call themselves Israeli. And I had to stop the conversation at a certain point to say, it's, it's shocking to me that no one is calling themselves an Israeli. Anyone, whether you were born or naturalized in Israel, is an Israeli. Within that, we have some different terms. This is a slang term that we use often, but it is not an official national or um, legal designation, a tzabar or tzabarit. Tzabar or tzabarit is slang for a native-born Israeli, right? The term you know, sabra, right? Why? Because the idea is it's named after the um, prickly pear fruit on the cactus um, that is full of spikes on the outside and soft and fleshy and mushy on the inside, just like the stereotypical Israeli. First off, Israelis, no, don't come necessarily like that. Um, second, the prickly pear cactus is not native to the land of Israel. Um, even though it has been um, appropriated by other peoples in the region, it is in fact an import from Central America. If you know the flag of Mexico, for example, that's where it's indigenous, not to the Mediterranean or the land of Israel, but it is used for a couple hundred years as a natural fence. Um, and that's where its usage came here because it also grows very well in the Mediterranean climate. The point though is this is slang. This is not an official designation. What is an official designation in Israel among many terms is Ole or Ola. An Ole, male um, immigrant to Israel, um, and Ola, female immigrant to Israel. But it's incorrect that I just said immigrant. An ole or an ola is someone who is an immigrant to Israel under the law of return. You are not just a regular immigrant. A regular immigrant, and I'll write that in here as well, is a mehager or mehager or mehager. 
depending on how you say the letter resh. And that simply comes from the verb to immigrate or emigrate. Can be anywhere. It can be to the US, it could be to Europe, wherever. Ole and ola come from the verb aliyah and have to do with someone who makes aliyah under the law of return, meaning that they have at least one Jewish grandparent or have converted under a recognized um, authority and are under the law of return are entitled to automatic citizenship. Okay, that's simply what it means. Within that, we have a societal difference of chadash versus chadasha, ole chadash, ola chadasha, a quote unquote new immigrant, versus an ole vatik or ola vatika. These are subjective terms. These are sociological terms. We don't really make that distinction. Um, it is certainly um, on a in your documents and things like that. You won't see a difference between these. Um, but just know that if you are called an ole chadash, ola chadasha, um, it means you've recently made aliyah versus an ole vatik or an ola vatika, someone who has uh, made aliyah a long time ago. What is recent and what is a long time ago is entirely subjective, folks. Um, most people will simply say ole or ola um, chadash, chadasha, because that's just what they've been taught to say. Um, I am, for example, no way a... Um, Ole Chadash, I've been here too long, but I wouldn't call myself an Ole Vatik. I am an Ole, but I'm more importantly a Yisraeli. Okay? That's how I use this term. I don't define myself as an immigrant, although I am, I'm Yisraeli. Okay, another term that you'll hear when we talk about ourselves, this one I like, this one I think is funny and ironic, is Anglo or anglo saxi Anglo comes from, or Anglo-Saxon comes from Anglo-Saxon, right? In Hebrew, in modern Israeli society, anyone who is a native English speaker is deemed an Anglo-Saxon. That comes from the days of the British Mandate, um, when English was being taught on a regular basis. The people who were teaching it were Anglo-Saxons. They were Christian British officers and their families who were living in Mandate Palestine. Right. That term has stayed around. And so, yes, people will call themselves an Anglo or an Anglo-Saxi, Anglo-Saxit, Anglo-Saxim, Anglo-Saxiot. Um, I obviously like the latter, Anglo-Saxi, because without the nikud, the dots and bars that indicate vowels, this is also how we say the word sexy in Hebrew. So, yes. Do I think Anglos are attractive? Yes. So I like this one, but everyone does their own. I also just like the... Um, irony of someone who looks like I do, much less all of us um, being called Anglo-Saxons. I just, I, uh, the irony is delicious. Another way we're often um, designated as Olim me Medinot HaMa'arav, Olim or immigrants from Western countries, as opposed to Medinot HaArav from Arab countries or Medinot HaMizrach from Eastern countries or from anywhere else in the world. When you say you're from the West, Medinot HaMa'arav. Ma'arav is West. Medinot HaMa'arav, the countries of the West. When we say that, we're specifically referring to Western Europe um, and the Americas, but also South Africa and Australia. But equally important, and I use this term a lot in Hebrew, and I highly encourage you all to as well, is Aliyah Meratzon. Okay? Aliyah Meratzon is Aliyah out of one's free will. Remembering that for the majority of Israeli society of history and Zionist history, most aliyah was not miratzon. Most aliyah to the land of Israel and the state of Israel was done because people were fleeing something, right? They were fleeing pogroms, persecution, the Shoah, whatever it may be. Um, if you're coming from a Medinat, Medinot Amarav, from the Western countries, chances are at least as of now, you're making aliyah meratzon. You're making aliyah out of one's free will. You're choosing to make aliyah rather than being compelled to do so for all the reasons I said before. Okay, so um, another great terminology to use. And then finally, before I stop to answer questions and tell you next week's class, another great question, whether you have the answer now, this is a great question to think about going into Yomatz mode. This is a great question to think about, especially for those of us who've already made Aliyah. To a male, to a female, 
What makes you proud to be an Israeli? Lehit ga'e be is to be proud of. Lehit ga'ot, excuse me, lehit ga'ot is the verb. Lehit ga'ot, to be proud of, is followed by the preposition be. So ani as a male, ani mit ga'e be. Female would answer ani mit ga'a be. And the phrasing of this question is bima, in what makes you proud to be an Israeli? Or what makes you proud to be an Israeli in regular English? A great question to be answered Today, certainly tomorrow for Yom Atzmud, certainly every day that we live in Israel. I want to take some questions in the Q&A, and then I want to tell you about next week's class, as well as this week's um, uh, conversation class reminder. Okay, Q&A. Um, will October 7th be another Yom and Will it have the same name? That's a great question. Um, we have some initial plans of what it's supposed to look like. It's going to be a national day of mourning. Um, it's not going to be called Yom Hazikaron in the same sense. It'll probably be called Yom Hazikaron Lechalalei uh, Chavot Barzel. Ch Chavot Barzel, the Swords of Iron, is the official technical name of this war. In all likelihood, that name is going to change also for various reasons, um, but it will be a national day of mourning starting this year and all subsequent years. The name of it is still not clear. Is Chalalei from Hallelujah? No, it is not. Chalal is with a Chet. Hallelujah is with a He. Chalal, Hallelujah. Two very different words. In Ranana, there are names of fallen soldiers over every street sign on the main street. Um, what does this mean? Rechov uh, Ein Shin, I don't know. Ein um, Shin could mean stand for a lot of different things. Whenever you see two apostrophes between two letters or at the end of a word um, between the penultimate and ultimate letters, it means that it stands for something. Um, I don't know what that means off the top of my head. I would need some, usually there's a description under it. Um, if you have it, you're welcome to send it to us by email. We'll be happy to translate for you. Uh, what is the root of shchol? Shchol is shin kaf lamed. Um, we use it in the context of grieving and bereavement. That's pretty much all we use it for. Um, shakul is bereaved. Shchol is bereavement or grief. Um, that's really the only way we use that term, that word, and its root. Uh, there's also the slang use of korban as sweetie, my dear one. Uh, my Israeli teacher said to think of it as I would die for you. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. No one will say korban shali. They'll say kapara alecha, which we've talked about many times as slang from Moroccan Jewish Arabic, which means... Um, which is the equivalent of I would die for you. Um, but korban is not a typical word that you hear as slang, as a term of endearment. Um, I would highly advise not using that term. Um, that's very dark, even for Israeli humor. Korban, maybe it's a different pronunciation, but I've never heard that before. And if I did, I would be a little uh, aghast. Can you review the difference between Iskalti and Zakalti again? I will because I know that kerfluffled a lot of people um, in our class. I'll be happy to do that once I go through the rest of these questions. Um, Beta Almin, eternity, same root as Almana. Um, no, that is not true. Sorry, like I said, Beit Almin is Aramaic. It is not Hebrew. Very important, folks. When I tell you, even though Aramaic is our sister language, we use a lot of it in um, modern Hebrew, okay? But it is not the same thing. Um, Beit Almin is with, where are we? Beit Almin is with an Ayn, Almin. Almin is related to the word Olam in Hebrew, right? Olam means both world and eternity in Hebrew. Almin means the same thing in Aramaic. This is Aramaic. Almana, widow, is with an Aleph. Just because the letters sound similar in no way means they're the same. Remember, we've talked about this many times before. In Hebrew, spelling is destiny. You cannot swap out one, sound, one letter for another simply because they sound alike. They mean completely different things. The root ayin lamed mem means something completely different than the one that we use for a widow almana. Great question, but two different things.
But thank you for raising that so I could clarify that further. Q&A. Someone schooling me about Memorial Day in the UK. Thank you, Fett. We're going to move on. Um, Sheen Kaf Lamed in the Torah is used when a parent loses a child. That's why, is this why in modern Hebrew it's used instead of Evel? Correct. That's a great reason why. Shchol means grief or bereavement. Evel, um, the root Aleph Bet Lamed, has to do with mourning in general. Right? I didn't use the word mourning here, folks. I used the word grief and bereavement. Shchol. That's the way we say it in Hebrew. Mourning has to do with evel, avelut, different things like that. Different word. Great point. Thank you for bringing that up. What is the difference between lapidim and masuot? They both mean torch. They both mean torch. Um, the song is anu nosim lapidim. We carry torches. But the ceremony itself, it's called tekes hadlakata masuot. There are two different words for a torch. In fact, actually, there's a slight difference. You'll see um, a lapid is an actual torch, like a thing that you're thinking of, like a stick. And the masu'a is more like um, a, a brazier, like a little bonfire almost. Um, can I answer I made aliyah because of a person? Like, say, biglal dol. Absolutely. We all make aliyah for different reasons. I often say we make aliyah for irrational reasons. Love, Zionism, um, change in life, whatever it may be. Um, so yes, if it's because of someone, biglal ben zugi or bat zugi, I made it because of my partner or spouse or biglal and the person's name. Great question. Hagdara is category similar to hagdarot, meaning categories or settings. Yes, same exact word. Great question. I was going to show a video clip. Yes, I am. I just want to finish these questions before um, I go to it. Um, is there a way to say to commemorate? Yes, you can look it up, but the word is litzayen. Sadi yud yud nun. Okay, people going way off the categories. I love all these questions. Um, Um, okay, I've been using the word netia for you have a tendency. Yes, netia means tendency or orientation. Um, great question. Kavana has, okay, great question, because I see this coming up in a couple questions before I move on to the video. I specifically used here, I plan, not to intend. The verb to intend to do something, lehit kaven. A lot of people, I'm probably guessing with more um, Jewish educational backgrounds, are thinking of the Hebrew word kavana, which means intention. I did not use the word intend here. I said, I plan. If you want to say, I intend, you can absolutely use the verb lehit kaven. Folks, I'm giving you sample sentences here to prompt conversation. This is not a dogmatic religion nor a dogmatic society. You have other ways of asking and answering questions. I'm giving you a sample sentence here. You could absolutely say, I intend to in another few years. I, in talking about Yom Atzmud and Yom Azikaron and Sionut of actual physical things that took place to make this place um, a country again for us, believe in planning of physical things rather than intention. Intention is incredibly important in everything we do, but planning and actually putting forth an action plan is no less. So I use the verb mitachnen. You could absolutely say, ani mitkaven, I intend to in another few years. Ani shoef, I aspire to in another few years. Another great verb. Ani mekaveh, I hope in another few years. But that I used one verb doesn't negate using any others, folks. I'm just giving you the construct here. You can plug in anything you want here. Not just the number and not just the period of durations. These are prompts for you to fill in yourself. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that so I could answer it accordingly. Okay, before I get to any last questions, I want to show this clip because I think it's also a great way to cap off talking about 
both Yom HaZikaron, Yom HaTzmud, and Aliyah. This is a clip that is running on Khan, Israel's public broadcasting, that is about Olim dealing with Yom HaZikaron. And I'm just showing the second half of this clip. I'll sh we'll share with you the um, link to it. This is from Khan. This is something that's running today about a family who lost their eldest. Um, no, their second oldest in a battle um, in Gaza. Sorry, let me just make sure that I shared it right so you can hear it. Yes. Okay. It's got English subtitles, so... I also want to be sure to show this one as opposed to other ones that are out there. Danny Julian Weil, Stiel Enpo, and I'm going to go to the house of 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 the Listen to what he asked him. Talked about making Aliyah, right? And he answered, Sionut Neto, pure Zionism. Neto, like the word net in Hebrew, in English. Sionut Neto, pure Zionism. <laughs> ‫הלאלמעלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאלאל
Again, you have to listen to the however, because I'm teaching you the theory and the practice. In practice, you will never hear this verb conjugated in the past tense, never. Maybe once in a while, but it is not common practice from a native Hebrew speaker to conjugate this verb in the past tense. I'm teaching you that so that you won't do it. Instead, you will use the other verb, lehizachil. Yes, lehizachil literally translates into English as to be reminded or to recall. However, if you want to say, I remembered, you're going to answer, I remembered, as in Hebrew, as saying, I was reminded or I recalled that. Yes, I recall that. Ani niskalti. Ah, ken niskalti. Now I remember that. Now I recall that. That's how we use it. Okay? Lehizachel is used in the past and present tense. Meaning, if you want to say, I remembered, this is what you're going to use. Lizkol is only used in the present and future tense. You're rarely, if ever, going to hear it in the past tense. And lahazkil is almost always used in the present and future tense. Could you say, I reminded him yesterday to do something? Yes. Are you going to hear it? The answer is likely no. Again, can you use it versus are you going to hear it? Theory practice. I'm trying to teach you here the practice. You are not going to hear lisko in the past tense very often, nor are you going to hear lazkil in the past tense. Therefore, I'm teaching you this so that you won't use it. Okay? That's all I'm trying to do here is give it some modern day context that an Ulpan book, and yes, even a formal Ulpan teacher isn't necessarily giving you the actual praxis, the actual application of the, he of the Hebrew language in a modern contemporary sense. I learned many years Hebrew in a co formal context with that crutch. You weren't actually using learning how to use it in a contextual sense. That we are teaching with nefesh benefesh means that it's all about how to use it Miad immediately. Okay, with that, we are way over time. I want to let people go to a Tekes Maval or whatever they have plans tonight. So, Dagaba, thank you all for joining. Next week, we are going to be talking about ways to improve your vocabulary. Lisko and Lihizachil was a great tiskoret reminder of how to do that, right? Not just teaching you the words, but how to actually use them. Next week, we're going to go through some great vocabulary that's going to improve your your speaking and reading skills, um, and to further um, improve and enlarge um, your otsar milim, your vocabulary. Those of you who are joining us for Cafe Ole Conversations, you already saw some of the questions you're going to be prompted to ask and answer with each other, um, talking about Aliyah and Zionism, as well as whatever you did during these two days. So with that, I hope you continue to have a meaningful Yom Zikaron a soon to be meaningful, however you choose to celebrate it, Yomat's mood, Independence Day. Todah and we'll see you all next week. Litaot.